course of the uh, session and the missing chunks for delaying your lunch. Um, I'll uh, try to make this a good presentation. Uh, and thanks to Marco for letting me use his computer. <laughs> yes, okay. So my name is Chris Eikamp. I work at the Henri Tudor Institute in Luxembourg. I'm here today to talk about iGuess, which is our distributed uh, modeling platform based on uh, open web services. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about what iGuess is, how it works, um, and then I'm going to uh, have a section on the lessons that I learned, or that we learned programming it, and then some ideas for uh, advancing the web systems, web, web services ecosystem for, uh, to make projects like this a little easier. And of course, there will be cowboys. <laughs> So, uh, music is a European project uh, intended to help cities reduce their CO2 emissions, primarily through in the areas of energy production and uh, energy consumption. It's a partnership of five European cities and two research agencies. And I guess is the modeling platform and decision support system uh, that's a primary component of the music project. And the types of questions that I guess is intended to answer are things like, how much solar potential do we have in the city? Where can we install solar panels most effectively? Uh, is there geothermal potential here? Uh, mainly, uh, a, a lot of questions around the production of energy actually within the city. So we had a couple of uh, primary design goals when we set out uh, to work on I guess. So the first thing was, it was interoperability between the partners. We wanted partners to be able to provide data about their cities and perhaps other partners to provide models. And we needed to make sure that there was a way that the data and the models could work together. We wanted to simplify access to modeling tools. If, if any of you have done much modeling, you know sometimes models can be very complex to configure and run. Now some of that complexity is just inherent in modeling. It's a complex business. But we were looking for ways that we might be able to simplify the process a little bit. Uh, and we wanted to create a reusable framework. We wanted to use this, this code for other projects. We wanted our partners to be able to use it for other projects. And we wanted to uh, have it be open source so, so anybody could use it. And so the, the code base had to be distributable. So when we, we took all these things together, we decided that I guess should be designed around open web services uh, and that ecosystem. So this is uh, just a very schematic view of how I guess fits into uh, the, the services that we use. Uh, over on the, um, say this, the left, the right, this side, the far side <laughs> of, uh, of the diagram you see, these are the model services, uh, model servers. So these are WPS servers that can live anywhere on the internet. We have data servers over here on the right that are, are also uh, data provided by people on the internet, and I guess is in the middle. I guess doesn't host any uh, processes. I guess doesn't host any data. It just acts as a middleman, a kind of a matchmaker to help uh, match up data services with modeling. And then it will uh, help serve out the results of the modeling process. So one thing I'd like to point out on this diagram is that uh, there's a, a gray box around these different services. And the reason that the box encompasses all the services together is because we see these data services as, as, as components of a really of a single aggregate composite data service. We don't think of WFS as different than WCS. I mean, it is different, but we al we also what we really think of is these are data servers. So from the modeling perspective, that we don't really differentiate between those two. So this is a screenshot of I guess, and this is just all this is showing here is just a list of the different models that have been registered uh, with the system currently. And it doesn't matter if these are all on one WPS server or on different WPS servers. The user doesn't care where they are. The user just has these registered models that they can, they can use and run. So what I'm going to do now is, is, is open up one of these, expand one of these tabs, and show you what's on the inside. So here we have uh, there's a description of the model at the top. Then we have a list of all the, the inputs that the model requires. And down at the bottom is a list of outputs. All this is is just a formatted view of the uh, WPS servers get capabilities string. It's a request you can make to, to WPS server that will tell you what it can do. And um, this also all this is is just a, a view of that response. But before we can can run a model, we have to add data. So I'm going to show you how we get data into I guess. So this is our uh, data import screen, uh, or, or it's more of a data registration screen because we don't actually import data. All we're doing is 
registering where the data lives on the internet. So you put a URL in up at the, t uh, up at the top there, and uh, the, the, the web client will go off and make requests using WMS and uh, WCS and WFS to find out what data is available at these URLs. It pulls back the responses it gets from all these things uh, and creates a little, uh, uh, a little like, I don't know, I think of it as, a, as an index card showing what the data is. You get a snapshot of the data. Uh, you can see if the data is available for, uh, for mapping, if, it, if the WMS server has responded, or if the data is available as a model input. But probably the most important thing on the screen is the tagging. So when you register a data set, uh, you can assign tags to it. And these tags are drawn from the uh, identifier, input identifiers of the different WPS processes. So when you start tagging data sets, when you import a data set and assign a tag, you're essentially associating that data set with the input to a model. And we'll see how that works in just a minute. So this is the uh, actual model configuration screen. This is essentially the same information here that we saw earlier. We've got the model description, the inputs, and the outputs. But in this case, we can actually start assigning data sets to each model input. So for example, on this top one is a, a digital surface model. Uh, any data set that we tag with DSM is available as, a, as an input in this drop-down box. So we can register a lot of data sets with iGUESS, but if you've only tagged one or two of them as DSMs, those are the only ones you have to worry about deciding when you're, when you're configuring those. So you can go through, assign uh, input data sets to all the model inputs. Uh, if the model, in this case, there's a, a place where the model requires a string entry, you can type that in. Basically, you configure the model by providing, you know, just specifying what all the inputs are. And then down at the bottom, you can say, what do you want the output data sets to be called? So we get that all configured. Everything's happy. We've provided all the inputs that, that uh, we need, and we have the option to run the model. So here the model is running. It says running. That's how you know it's running. Um, and it goes. And uh, WPS, uh, the, the protocol, says that you can, if you, what we do here, we start pulling the WPS server. And if the WPS server is well behaved, it will tell us its progress as it goes. So for example, uh, in this case, um, the, the model is 25% completed, and we get that, uh, just that status indicator in the browser. So the model runs away, runs, 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 and finally, hopefully, it finishes. And then what we can do is we've created, in this case, two new data sets. We can view those data sets. We can use them as inputs into other processes or um, download them and, and analyze them further on the desktop. And so this is uh, just a quick view of our map viewer, a data viewer. There's nothing particularly interesting here for people at this conference. I'm sure you've seen plenty of uh, map viewers. It doesn't doesn't do anything special. So what I want to talk to you now about is what we learned while we were developing this system. So first we have the, the, the good things. <laughs> so the system is it's easy to deploy updates. If we fix a model, fix a bug on a model, a data set gets updated, these, uh, you know, by, by any of the data owners, these changes are propagated immediately to all the users of the system. You don't need to install new software. You don't need to download new data. It just happens automatically. Uh, data owners retain control of their data, and that's important for some people. They don't want to give their data set away. They want to feel that they still retain ownership. So by using web services this way, uh, we can use other people's data, but we don't have to take it from them. And we can use data in models that are developed by other people and perhaps put them together in ways that we hadn't anticipated. Someone could register a new model with a system that we hadn't seen before and use it with data that we might not have seen before and come up with a result that we hadn't anticipated. So this, this type of system gives us flexibility to be creative and allow other people to be creative. And uh, we, we find that to be a, an important thing. It's based on open standards. There's no vendor lock-in. I come from a long history of using Esri, so this is a really new thing for me. I like it. And uh, the system is flexible. Uh, by plugging in different models and different data sets, you can suddenly do entirely new things. So these are all great, great aspects of this architecture. So not everything is great, though. So we have five partners, as I said earlier. And each of them had a, 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 what to me was an interesting problem. So the first one I call the WFWTF problem. 
And this is uh, <laughs> basically uh, an observation that we dealt with a lot of very professional, very educated, talented GIS managers, and almost none of them had heard of web services. So if you're going to de de deploy a model with people in the real world who are maybe not the people at this conference, they're not necessarily going to know what web services are, how to set up a, uh, a WTF server, uh, and, and, and so on. Now another problem we had was that one city had, uh, one of our partners had contracted all their IT functions to a private company. I'm not sure why they would do that, but that's what they did. Now the company was very happy to set up web services for them, as long as it was itemized in the contract, appropriate change <laughs> fees were paid to change the contract, and uh, it, took, uh, it took over a year to get everything renegotiated, get the money sorted out, and get, get this all working. I mean, just to set up a server. Sometimes in-house IT can be a problem. Uh, one of our partners had an IT department that was not very happy to open new ports on the firewall, to have servers that were not under their control running. You know, some IT places in, 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 in some parts of some, some places, uh, maybe you've worked in places like this, don't really, they want to control everything. And so if, if you're dealing with people in that, who are in that kind of environment, uh, that's, it's, it's a difficult issue to overcome. Uh, data security and privacy concerns are, are a big issue here. Uh, one of our partners had a, a, a DEM or a DSM data set they purchased from a vendor. They couldn't put that service or that data on a, on a web public web service because it violated the, the contract and the copyright of the data. So that was, a, that was an important issue. They also had data that was uh, utility data. It was aggregated somewhat to the block level, but then there were some blocks that only had one household on them. So you, even with aggregated data, you could still get information about individuals' utility consumption, and there are some really legitimate concerns with publishing data uh, that can be tied back to individuals. So that's another issue with putting data into this kind of ecosystem. Uh, and finally, the, some of the, our partners' software just has poor support for web services. For example, one of our partners is using an old version of MapGuide, which just doesn't support WCS uh, data. And, that's a problem. So the conclusion from this was that sometimes the non-technical issues are bigger than the technical ones. And when you're dealing with partners who are you know, not necessarily on the cutting edge, this is, 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 is a real issue. So the ugly. It gets better, right? This is primarily a comment on my feelings towards WCS. I think WCS, the WCS is, a, is, is a service for providing raster data. And it's in itself, it's a fine thing. It's just that nobody supports it. And uh, not too many people seem to be using it. So there's a lot of library, like we, we use uh, open layers and GeoAx, and we actually wrote WCS uh, services for these. And I think sometime in the next week or two, for open layers anyway, the WCS code will be rolled into the main, the main release. Um, QGIS is actually supporting, I just learned this uh, yesterday, is, is, will be supporting WCS. Uh, maybe as of today, if, uh, if they release on schedule. But until today, they didn't support WCS. So if, you need, if you're building a system that relies on WCS, uh, as we did, um, this is, this is a, a problem. It will get better over time, but right now, uh, there's still a lot of packages that don't support it. Okay, unstable. <laughs> There's a lot that can go wrong in this ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of ways things can fail. You're dealing with servers all over the network. You have network issues. You have server issues. Servers go down. People take data sets away. Things happen that are, it, it, that, that doesn't happen on the desktop. I mean, no one sneaks into your office in the middle of the night, probably, and steals your, your data sets. So there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in this environment. Uh, there's a, most of the systems are beyond your control, right? So you, you might be using, I guess, as your modeling platform, but uh, somebody has changed the version of a software somewhere, or it, it, some, these remote pieces may not support the same versions of the protocols you're hoping uh, are supported. And there's just a lot of, lot of stuff that can happen. And this, because there's so many different pieces of software that people can plug into this ecosystem, it's very difficult to actually test and verify that your system works. And uh, so what often will happen is you get an error somewhere. We do have some good ways of propagating the error back to the user, 
but oftentimes you get errors that look like this. You show this to a user who's using, I guess, trying to run a model on, on solar panels, and you know, they're not going to know why, what, what's wrong with it. I didn't know what was wrong with that. And that came from our, actually came from one of our servers. So, but um, you know, this was a problem because the WCS server somewhere was misconfigured and it caused the WPS server to fail. And you know, it's just, uh, it's difficult. So the undead, if the zombie cowboy, <laughs> what presentation would be complete without a zombie? <laughs> so actually there's two. Uh, the, uh, this is primarily a comment on the fact that w a WPS server is immortal. Now, what I mean by this is not actually immortal, they crash all the time, but um, <laughs> what, I, what I mean by this is that uh, once you start running a WPS process, you can't kill it, I mean, at least within the protocol. I mean, you can unplug the server, but there's no way within the WPS uh, uh, service protocol to kill this thing. Now, we have our solar model uh, if, if somebody uploads a, a reasonably large data set, this thing will run for two or three weeks. It's a huge process. It consumes a lot of resources, a lot of power. It's, it's expensive to run this. Somebody starts running this and says, oh man, I should have put a two in instead of a three. Uh, they stop running it. Well, okay, I guess says, fine, the process is gone. It forgets about it. But the WPS processor process just keeps running. So if weeks go by while this thing is is, is, is in the undead state. And meanwhile, that person may have launched another one and then decided they didn't want that. And uh, you know, so we you can end up with a lot of, lot of processes going. Uh, it's expensive. There's no way to kill them. Uh, and this is, a, this is a real problem. So the future. These are my ideas for how the ecosystem could be improved uh, in, in, in coming years, and I hope will be. So the first one is, uh, this idea of, uh, I don't know if, if, if any of you who worked in great, deal, uh, great detail with web services, but uh, WFS and WCS, which are the, the vector and raster uh, providing services, have a, have a thing called get capabilities that describes what the server has. Now, currently, you have to make that request separately for WPS and W, uh, sorry, WCS, and this is like, this is soup to me. It's like, uh, like web services soup, so I get them confused sometimes. But, so you do a get capabilities for WFS and WCS, and then you have to maybe do a describe coverage or describe feature request. And you get all these, make all these requests, and you get all this data back, and then you have to try and sort it all out and, and hope there's nothing conflicting, that, and I hope everything looks good, and it's, it's a real pain. And it would be great if there was just a way to say, get me all the metadata for all the data on this server in just one request. So that would be my first idea: is to to simplify the way, simplify the process of getting data, getting metadata about the data um, that's on a server. Second one is WPS. Uh, this is the the model running service. Requests um, uh, has you know it, it, you have to provide all this data to run a model, but the WPS process does not actually describe what it needs very well. Uh, you can provide it. You can get a style sheet that. Uh, uh, it is fairly detailed, but processing this and parsing this and understanding the style sheet is very, very complicated, and we haven't found any good tools for doing it. What would be great is if a model could say, here's the data that I need, and you could take and, and describe it in detail, and you could send that description off to a data service and say, hey, data service, what data do you have that matches this description? And then the data service could say, well, okay, this data set looks like you could use, you could use this data set as an input. And if there's a way that the WPS could cooperate better with the data providing services, uh, it would make life a lot easier for everybody. Uh, WPS uh, also uh, should have some callbacks, I think. Right now, uh, when you start running a model, uh, in this case, let's say our three-week uh, solar zombie uh, model, the model, it, it runs, and you have, to, you have to ping it, start pinging the server and say, hey, are you done yet? How are you doing? Are you done yet? We do this every minute. Now, if this thing is running for weeks and we're, we're calling it every minute, that seems to me to be a little bit wasteful. I would really like to have the, the, when the server is done running, it could call a URL and say, hey, I'm done now. And then uh, we could carry on. Um, and this also applies to very, very short processes. You have a process that runs in a second, but you're, you're only checking on it once a minute. That means the user could, ha could have an almost instantaneous feedback from running the model but instead might have to wait a whole minute until your polling cycle goes through. So if the WPS server just had a way of announcing its status to somebody, uh, that would be great. 
Uh, number four is just want to kill the zombies uh, using your favorite zombie control method. There just needs to be a way for WPS to, to be terminated. And then the last one is uh, it would be great to augment XML with JSON. And what I mean by that is you do a, a get capabilities request, the server tells you about itself, and it tells you about itself in XML format. Uh, browsers don't understand XML. If you're doing this on, something on the client side, you get back XML, now you need to interpret that XML. And that usually requires a fairly big library. And if you're running on a phone or a tablet, uh, there's a lot of JavaScript you need to download in order to, uh, to make, this, make this work. And if, if uh, any of you have looked into the open layer source code, a lot of it is just XML parsing code. If we could get a response in JSON, browsers can understand JSON natively. Uh, we could cut out a bunch of stuff from open layers, simplify it, make life easier for developers, make life easier for users, and I think uh, make everything work a little bit better. So those are my ideas for how things can be improved. And we are now at the end of the presentation. I thank you for your attention. Um, so could, could you, I, I think that's mostly right, but yeah. could you just repeat that again quickly? So you have a catalog of data from wherever your users are. Okay, the catalog of data comes not from, it, it that's, comes from the registration process. So the user enters a URL of a data service and then kind of builds the catalog on, I guess. Right, and then when you want to run the process, does the data not actually be sent across to the processing machine? Ah, no. And, okay, that's the question. No. <laughs> Well, okay. Well, of course the data, uh, the, the processing service needs the data in order to, to run, of course. Uh, but it doesn't come through, I guess. What I guess does is sends the URL of that data to the WPS server, and the WPS server will, on its own, download uh, the data set from the, from the data providing. Is that? That's absolutely fine, and that's what I understood, but are there not problems with that? that yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, well, I mean, when it works, it, it's great. It, it, uh, when it works, and it usually works, it's great. But if somebody has uh, removed the data set since you last saw it, or un if the network is not working. I'm really just thinking about size. Are you going over, a, I guess, a public internet uh, connection where if you want to be doing stuff to say aerial imagery or satellite imagery, you've got gigabytes to transfer, which seems yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes, that's true. Um, yeah. There's no real, I guess. It's, it's unavoidable. Yeah, yeah. If your processor, processing service is different than the guy who has the data, uh, there's no way to avoid that. But, so. you, but you could help the people who have the data to install a local processing service which they can connect to? We could, but uh, by doing that, you reduce the modularity of the system. You start, people are now starting to install software. And we have pro enough problems just getting uh, our customers uh, or partners data providing services up, if they had to also have now processing services that are going to be sitting there processing for weeks at a time, that's going to be uh, too much. But yes, I, th I think your points are well stated. Yeah, thank you. Really fascinating presentation. You know, the architecture that you've outlined here um, is fairly generic in the sense that have some process, you have data coming in, you have data going out, you're defining you know, data coming from different sources. The OGC has something called OpenMI, which is a you know, kind of, I think it's a, an attempt to standardize this kind of architecture. And I also came across the, the uh, it's, it's a bit of a funny organization, but it's the, um, it's the National Rural Electric, uh, so the, Electric Co-op Organization in the U.S., which has a an R and D uh, arm, and they're interested particularly in running um, electric electric um, network models. In other words, to be able to determine, you know, fairly you know detailed stuff about voltages and and current flows, whatever. But it's designed to be a generic model, of very 
similar to the architecture that you outlined hmm. here. So, I mean, I think what, you, what you've done, it, this is going to be the general, I mean, this seems to me, this is going to be the general architecture for how we do modeling in the future. You know? And there's always the details on how you, you know, deal with these problems that you mentioned, moving that around or whatever, and there'll be generic ways to do that kind of thing. But I think, you know, this really is the future of how we're going to do modeling exercise, whether it's electric power modeling or the kind of modeling you're doing. Just a comment. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Oh, we want you. I'm going to bring the microphone back or? Okay. And uh, we'll probably make it a last question because according to the program, there's supposed to be another session started already. Ah. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, we're using WCS basically in its simplest form. We uh, just grab everything and let the WPS server figure out what it what it needs to do with it. Because uh, if you now if if you wanted to start adding bounding boxes and clipping and stuff like that, then the interface becomes much more complicated. Um, so yeah, we're just using it in in the, the most basic raw form. Okay, everyone, I'm going to call it a day there because uh, I don't know I need lunch. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask Chris? So you'll be able to be paid. No worries. Sorry. Maybe we can have a screenshot of one of the slides. Sure. This is your, uh, your architecture slide. Sure. And the. Uh, yeah, what, uh, so we, I work from Delian. Um, <laughs> 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 <laughs>